Local programming on KRWG made possible in part by viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome to Fronteras Changing America. I'm Edwin Resendez. April 1598 marked the birth of the American Southwest with the founding of San Elisario, Texas. Today on Fronteras a Changing America, we visit the Camino Real of San Elisario with over 400 years of history. Along the Rio Grande, only 20 miles from El Paso, lies the historic town of San Elisario, a town with a very colorful past a step back in time, a town with over 400 years of history, beginning with the arrival of the Oñate expedition in 1598, where legend has it, the only jail Billy the Kid broke into still stands, and where common salt was the motive for violence, looting, and murder. These and many more interesting stories can be discovered with a visit to the San Elisario Historical Society which is housed in the Los Portales Museum building, right in the heart of town. The museum and gift shop is staffed with knowledgeable and dedicated volunteers from the San Elisario Genealogy and Historical Society. A tour of the museum will reveal a treasure trove of information about the early area settlers and their descendants, many of whom still live in San Elisario. Come along as we take a brief glimpse into the rich history that awaits your discovery. In 1598, about 500 Spanish colonists, their wives, children, and clergy wearily crossed the Samalayucan Desert, heading north to establish Nuevo Mexico. The caravan, stretching over three miles long with more than 80 carts, wagons, and thousands of head of cattle, horses, sheep, and other livestock eventually reached the Rio Grande. They were tired and thirsty. Their leader, Don Juan de Oñate, decreed a mass and celebration take place to mark their good fortune and to claim the land for the King of Spain, a ceremony and celebration known as La Toma. The Jewel of San Elisario is our beautiful chapel. It watches over and anchors the central plaza. The bells on the church served as a town clock to the people of San Elisario as well as the small towns across the Rio Grande. They rang to call the people to mass to give glad tidings such as a wedding, a baptism, or toll when someone died. Since all of the people were Catholic, life centered on the church its rules and ideologies. Back in the 1850s, San Elisario was the largest and most prosperous town in the area and became the first county seat. The San Elisario jail was housed in an adobe building and is best known as the only Texas jail that Billy the Kid broke into. That's right, broke into. See for yourself at our monthly reenactments. Here's what happened. When Billy the Kid found out his friend Melquiades Segura had been arrested in San Elisario, he set out from La Mesilla, New Mexico, arriving in town and pretending to be a Texas Ranger with a prisoner. He knocked on the door of the jail. The guard, fooled, opened the door and found himself face to face with Billy's 44 revolver. Finding the keys, Billy released Segura and raced across the river into Mexico. Today, walking down Main Street, you'll find the remnants of the old roller mill that served the community in the 1870s. As a long-standing monument to the people of San Elisario, the mill is where farmers brought their wheat and corn to be ground, made into flour, and sacked. Across the street, the warehouse that stored the surplus grains was called El Molino, and it still stands. In 1877, there broke out the bloodiest civil disorder 
in the county's history, the Salt War, featuring political greed, violence, and execution, most of which took place in and around San Elisario. The dispute was over a vast deposit of salt lying in the shallow lakes northeast of San Elisario. These lakes were the common property of the valley town as given to them by the Spanish crown. And when Texas won its independence from Mexico, it claimed this area, but promised to honor all the Spanish land grants. The local people, as well as people from Mexico, continued to take free salt as they had in the past. But when the group of greedy politicians filed claim for the lakes and began to charge people for salt, that's when things got really interesting. You can stop by the museum to get the full story. Today, you will find that San Elisario proudly celebrates its history and its heritage. In 2012, the district had the honor of being designated a prestigious Texas State Cultural District and is currently in the National Register of Historic Places. So come visit San Elisario. There is so much to see and to do just steps from the historic plaza. From contemporary and southwestern art galleries to our Veterans Museum, where you can view authentic military artifacts and take our veterans walk, or even stop by the gift shops and restaurants. We welcome you to our annual celebrations. In April, the community commemorates the arrival of the Oñate Expedition in 1598 with a reenactment, festival, and a historical conference. In June, the Billy the Kid Festival presents a world-renowned play, reenactment shootouts, and family fun with an Old West flavor. In November, a Veterans Day parade and special ceremonies honor the heroes that defend our country. And during Christmas, the chapel and the surrounding areas are set up with glowing luminarias. The third Sunday of every month, the art market fills with arts and crafts vendors and live entertainment. Make a day of it. There's something for everyone. Come visit San Elisario, the must-see destination along the Royal Spanish Trail and the birthplace of the American Southwest. Welcome back to Fronteras Changing America. I'm Edmundo Resendez. My guest today is Al Borrego. He is the director of the San Elisario Historic District down in Texas. Al, welcome to Fronteras Changing America. Thank you, Edmundo. We're coming up on the 26th Annual History Conference and Dinner. It's coming up on April 28th and 30th. Tell us about the event. Well, it's uh, actually two primary events that we'll be having. It's the Rio Grande Festival, it's our first annual, and uh, of course the 26th annual conference. The conference will, um, will uh, encompass the commemoration really of uh, the arrival of the Don Juan de Oñate uh, expedition of 1598. Uh, Let's talk about Don Juan de Oñate because mm -hmm. you know he's very, the name is very popular throughout New Mexico Correct. and of course West Texas. Mm -hmm. Who was he and how did he come to fi found this area? Well, Don Juan de Oñate was a Spanish colonizer. He's the, he's the first governor of New Mexico in 1598. Now the key to that is actually that uh, when he uh, did the official act of possession, of taking possession of the land that the Rio del Norte, the Rio Grande as we know it today, uh, drains into, he did it in San Elisario, Texas. Okay. Uh, so for almost 200 years from San Elisario all the way north into southern Colorado was New Mexico. The really fun part of that is that New Mexico was born before Mexico was. Yeah, I, I hear this a lot. Mm -hmm. When people talk it's about true. New Mexico, they're like, oh, back in old Mexico. It's like, no, New Mexico's yeah. older. Right, yeah. Me New Mexico was born in 1598. Of course, Mexico was born in 1821. So uh, you've got them beat by a lot. Well, let's talk about your passion for this mm -hmm. event. What, why such passion? Well, my family roots come from San Elisario. Uh, we date back, the earliest I can find them is 1816 in the area. But uh, a few years back, I came into the area again and, and uh, through my art, uh, 
we started the San Isidro Historic Art District. Uh, at that point, I was the president of the El Paso Art Association. But uh, we started the district, and it's grown into a big historical place now. It's got a lot of history, uh, 419 years of history to be exact. And it's the actual spot where Don Juan de Oñate did the taking possession of the land known as La Toma. La Toma? Uh-huh. Okay, so before San, it was known as San Elisario, it was known as La Toma? Oh, no, no, no. That's the act of possession. Okay. La Toma is La what Toma. it's called. Uh -huh. Oh, interesting. Yeah, taking possession of the land. Okay. Yeah, so that's what he did there in San Elisario. They had a mass, they had, they had a sermon, an ecclesiastical celebration, and in the afternoon they had a comedy. Um, that's a what they comedy? did. A comedy? had the prob probably one of the first uh, theatrical presentations in what is now the U.S. Uh, right there in August, on April the 30th, 1598. So we're, uh, this year is the first year since I've been there that we're actually having the event on the actual day. So he did that on April the 30th. Uh, on May the 1st, they started north and they came across the Rio Grande, which they were on the south side of the Rio Grande. Uh, they came across the Rio Grande uh, on May the 4th, 1598, right there by the University of Texas, El Paso. Let's talk about facts and myths. What mm -hmm. surprises people the most when they learn that San Elisario is the birth of the American Southwest? Well, I think just what you say when you say it, the birthplace of the American Southwest means a lot because you got to realize that when Oñate came through in 1598, um, there was nothing here. Uh, there was no technology, there was no guns, very few horses. Oñate brought in over 7,000 head of livestock. 7,000? Yeah, which was, you're talking cows, pigs, goats, sheep, horses. How many people were in this expedition? In this 539 expedition? souls. 539 yeah. souls. He had nine Franciscans. Uh, he had 120 soldiers. So obviously he's not gonna conquer anything. And uh, out of that expedition, 130 were complete families. He was going to colonize New Mexico. What they were in search of, of, the Spaniards, that is, they were in search of treasures for the crown. That's what they wanted to do. The Franciscans, of course, were in charge of Christianizing people. Mm -hmm. But uh, that's what happened in 1539. So if you look at uh, what happened uh, for the next 100, 200, 300, 400 years, San Elisario and the Camino Real that goes right through the historic district uh, became the supply route for the American Southwest for almost 300 years. Now, San Elisario is, of course, where the Camino Real start. In, in the U.S. In, in the U.S. Uh -huh. Talk to us about that. Well, the Camino Real is about 1,600 miles. It goes from Mexico City all the way up to Santa Fe, actually to O.K. Owenge, which is right there by Española. And uh, that route I mean, it's the Royal Highway to the Interior Lands. That's the Camino Real de Tierra Adentro. Royal Highway to the Interior Lands. So that highway, I mean, it served tons of people through the years. I mean, you can even do, go back to 1849. You know, we all know what happened there, right? The gold rush. Mm -hmm. So people that hit the, the river, the Rio Grande in that period, they hit an international border. So they come up the river, they go through San Elisario, right here through La Mesilla and then on west to California for the gold rush. What kind of challenges did they face in 1598 oh, can you they imagine? got here? Can you imagine? Because as you said, I mean, there, there was, you know, it was about 100 soldiers. Mm -hmm. They had to colonize this entire area. That's right, that's right. And it's, it's the desert. That's right, it's the middle of the desert. It's, it's funny that we were just talking about that yesterday in a, in a conference in, in Juarez. And um, we were talking about the fact that in, in, in the southern part of the Camino Real, well, the cities are like one after the other. They were built for a long time. The, the northern frontier was Santa Barbara, Chihuahua, Mexico, which is in the southern part of the state of Chihuahua today. And uh, from there south, uh, you had Zacateca, San Luis Potosí, Querétaro, and of course, Mexico City. So the cities were real close to each other. They used to call that El Camino de la Plata, the silver route. The silver route. So they used that for a while. It wasn't until other onesie twosie explorers like uh, the Sanchez uh, Rodriguez uh, expedition, the Espe Espejo expedition that came up north into what is now New Mexico, got up there south of Albuquerque and they're telling them about the seven cities of gold of Cibola. Of course. So that's what the Spaniards, their, their ears stood up when they heard that. And that's when they decided they had to colonize this area. 
So the, Espejo was the first guy that was going to try to colonize. He volunteered to pay for the expedition himself. But uh, uh, in his haste, he tried to get back to Spain to talk to the king, and he ended up dying somewhere near Cuba uh, on a boat. So when the word came back from the king to go ahead, Espejo was gone. The viceroy had to find a new guy to do it that would finance it, and uh, Don Juan Doñate family was very rich. They had a lot of silver mines. They were friends, and he got the duty. So he came up, put the expedition together, and they left Santa Barbara in the southern part of Chihuahua on um, January the 29th, 1598. They made it to San Elisario around April the 20th, and by April the 30th, they had the celebration La Toma took possession La of the toma, land. La Toma, which means the take. The taking. The taking. Yeah. Okay. So right. that's what happened. Let's talk about the Camino Real de Tierra Adentro. Mm -hmm. It's a World Heritage Site. What does that mean? Well, with UNESCO, it's a World Heritage uh, Trail. And the whole trail, the whole length of it is a World Heritage Trail. And on the trail, it's got, um, it's got 55 sites that are inscribed into the, into the trail site, into the World Heritage designation. Aside from the 55 sites, it also has five, um, five World Heritage sites itself that are within the Camino Real. So there's a total of 60 World Heritage designations on the Camino Real de Tierra Adentro. Now that's only in the Mexican side. That's only in the Mexican uh -huh. side. On the U.S. side, which is from San Elisario North, there are none. There are not that's, ways that. There's not one. Well, that's what we're going to try to find out and see what we have to do to be part of the game. And, and that's part of what this conference does. That's correct. We've got um, in Mexico, the stewards of the designation uh, are, is an organization called the Instituto Nacional de Antropología y Historia, otherwise known as INA. It's the National Institute of Anthropology and History. And that organization, which is a a government organization are the official stewards. They're in charge of preservation and uh, publicity and everything as far as the sites go. In the U.S., of course, we have the National Park Service. And uh, many speakers from ENA, the Institute, will be coming to speak at the conference. So we'll have um, people like uh, Dr. Schmal, who's the general coordinator of the historic district in Mexico City which is where the government buildings are, the Zócalo, if you've ever been to Mexico City. He's in charge of that historic district where the Camino Real basically started. He'll be coming to speak. We've got um, uh, directors of ENA from individual states that will be coming to speak and tell us you know, their experience on getting designated as a World Heritage Site. Uh, we have um, a lady by the name of uh, Nuria Sainz, who's the director of UNESCO in Mexico, will be coming to speak as well. So we've got a lot of people coming in that are part of the Camino Real, part of the designation system, and talk world heritage. And that's what we want to find out. What does it take to be part of that game? And what's been going on on the rest of the trail? So that we can learn and figure out a way that maybe we can get some of our places designated. Some of those 55 sites are things like uh, simply a church. Uh, a bridge, uh, a mountain range. Oh, really? uh, it could be just a uh, old hacienda, and these are actual sites that were designated as um, as uh, inscribed on the trail as an actual site, World Heritage site. All most of these sites, of course, are cultural sites. Let's talk about the actual conference and dinner. You have two events that are running at the same time. Well, we have actually, there's a lot of events within the events. Okay. We have the conference, which is on, uh, on the three days, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, the 28th, 29th, and 30th. And then uh, on, the on the 28th, which is Friday night, we have a, a special VIP dinner with, uh, with the Honorary Consul of Spain. Uh, the Ambassador of Spain to Mexico will be there. Uh, we've got a couple of uh, honorary councils, the one from Albuquerque, the one from Santa Fe will also be attending, um, the director of the Carlos Slim Foundation. Uh, we've got a lot of different people coming for that dinner, aside from local, uh, local dignitaries. Uh, dignitaries, yeah. We'll have some local ones too. Uh, that'll be on Friday night, special dinner. It's called La Feria, and it'll be, everything will be held at the Adobe Horseshoe Dinner Theater there in San Elisario. 
uh, the conference and that dinner. We also have a luncheon on for the Saturday uh, part of the conference, and that'll be an outdoor dinner, more of a Texas barbecue style din luncheon. We'll have that you as well. You can't have an event in Texas That's right, you gotta barbecue. have a barbecue. That's right, <laughs> it's Texas, yeah. And um, so we'll be having that. But aside from the conference at the, at the Adobe Horseshoe, in the rest of the district, we, we'll have the streets closed down and we'll have the Rio Grande Festival. The festival, this will be our first annual one. And what we're doing there is we actually do a reenactment of the arrival of the Oñate Expedition. Uh, those are, that's being directed by Eden Enterprises, which is Hector Serrano and David Mills. Uh, they'll be presenting that uh, on Sunday. Uh, and then we have two stages where we'll be having presenters from all over Mexico that'll be dance groups, uh, theatrical presentations. Uh, from Santa Barbara, where Don Juan de Oñate left, we have the youth orchestra will be coming to perform. Uh, tons of performers, tons of speakers coming from all over Let's the place. Let's talk about the speakers. Mm -hmm. What kind of speakers are we talking about here? Well, you're talking basically um, people that, that know how the Camino Real works people that know uh, how World Heritage works, the criteria to become a World Heritage site, basically what it takes. And then people that are gonna talk about preservation efforts along the Camino Real. Uh, there's, a, there's a city called Tepotzotlan near Querétaro, well, between Querétaro and Mexico City, who's um, on the Camino Real. Uh, they've got the National Museum of the Viceroy there. Uh, they'll be coming to speak about their museum and things that are there. Uh, people from the National Archives of Mexico City will bring documents so that we can see the actual documents uh, that were part of the Oñate Expedition. Uh, different uh, state archives that are bringing documents as well so that we can see documents. Everybody thinks that all the documents are in Spain, but the documents are in Mexico City because oh. that used to be Spain. Of course. You know, so that's, that's the type of speaker. Uh, we also have, of course, some, uh, some specialty speakers like... Um, people from Pueblos Magicos. There's a, there's a designation in Mexico that makes you a magical town, a Pueblo Magico. And these towns have been designated by the government as a tourist destination. So they get special cultural dollars to, to promote their town and, and boost up the tourism effort. We've got four uh, Pueblos Magicos that'll be visiting us as well. Uh, those speakers will speak a little bit about their town and, and what they do and they'll also be having uh, some booths that'll, uh, that'll present their town. They'll have uh, videos, uh, literature, stuff like that. One of the fun ones that we have coming that isn't on the Camino Real but is attached to San Elisario is the group from Paquime, which is uh, near Casas Grandes uh, here in the state of Chihuahua. Paquime is a World Heritage Site as well, and it's also Casas Grandes is a Pueblo Magico. Uh, that's the area also where the Mata Ortiz pottery comes from. They'll be coming down and they'll actually be turning some pots uh, there in, in the display area. We got people from the museum coming down. A lot of information, a lot of uh, history, a lot of culture. We got dancers that are coming from there as well. Um, and all over, I mean, Chihuahua, we've got Baroque music and symphony coming down to play and oh my that's you know in looking at the video that we played at the beginning of the show what fascinates me the most is the reenactments All right where do you get the people to do the reenactments you know it was kind of great the the people that you saw on that uh, on that video that was on january the 29th i was in santa barbara to be part of their first annual uh festival of the leaving of oñate and uh, what the new mayor did there is he he put together in a four month span, he put together a group to, to do the reenactment through the city. It was an hour and 45 minute play that went through the cities of Santa Barbara on their way to San Elisario. So they had over 60 actors that were part of that group and they put on a, a, a fabulous, fabulous reenactment of the, of the departure of the Oñate expedition. Uh, another fun thing about that group is they've been working their way along the Camino Real, not actually through the desert, but. They went to uh, Valle de Allende, they went to uh, San Francisco de los Conchas, uh, Hidalgo de Parral, they went to, now they're, they went to Chihuahua, they've been in Chihuahua. Last weekend they performed in Villa Humada, which if you follow it comes all the way down, and they'll be uh, doing a presentation on the 24th in Ciudad Juarez, and then they'll cross the river and they'll be with us 
for our uh, reenactment of the arrival of the Oñate expedition. So we're combining everybody in. Uh, we've connected pretty much everybody along the Camino Real this year that we could get to come down and be part of our celebration and celebrate the actual Camino Real, 1,600 miles. Let me ask you this real quickly. What are you looking forward to the most? Just seeing everybody together at once at once. I mean, we've even got uh, La Masia was involved in it, so is Albuquerque, so is uh, Santa Fe? Uh, Española. Española. Yeah, and we do have some people from Santa Fe coming as well, but but we've got speakers from all the way, all the way up and down the, the Camino Real. I think it's going to be exciting to see all of the connections. It's, it's amazing when you start looking all the way down the road and the same names keep, same surnames keep popping up, you know. It's pretty neat. Al Borrego has been our guest here on Fronteras of Changing America. I'm Edmundo Resendez. Thank you for joining us.